Good evening, uh, friends. We we will start up with the we'll discuss the other cases that we had posted for all of you. The this is a 45 year lady, a premenopausal essentially, with a lump as uh, shown in the picture here. That's a lump, and uh, you can see that it's about it was four into three centimeters lump. And there were no axillary lymphadenopathy. The lump was clinically firm to hard in consistency, suspicious that is. And uh, you can actually appreciate that the the breast is a little higher than the other breast, which is an important part of the uh, examination if you have to look at it. You see, you can see that it is there at a different level. And uh, the important thing in, in in the approach to the case actually although we gave you a truncated uh, history and examination. Everything else is fine. She has no family history. This has been there for the last two years. And for the last six months, it has suddenly started growing rapidly. And that's what makes it suspicious. And uh, as is supposed to be done, the patient was expected to what is called as the triple assessment which is a mandatory approach to any lump in the breast or any lesion in the breast to be very, very, very correct, uh, which means a detailed and a thorough clinical history, followed by, I mean, of course, and examination, followed by imaging and followed by core needle biopsy, which is the gold standard. A lot of you have written this, but don't write the term true cut biopsy. True cut biopsy is a, um, is a trade name. You don't need to write true cut. Core needle biopsy, right? It's true cut connects to, a, to an industry name, right? So triple assessment is what we'll subject the patient to. Some parts of it we have provided and we've got the mammography to for you to appreciate and you can actually uh, see that there is only one view that we have provided you and you can expand and see but you should ideally have both the CC and the MLO view craniocaudal and the medic medial lateral oblique and to call any mammogram um, to report on any mammogram without these two views is not acceptable. The craniocaudal view tells you about the quadrant in which it is present, upper or the lower, and mediolateral oblique is more precise in letting you know about certain aspects of the breast, which is something like, which is called the milk line or the milk line of tabar, as they call it, or no man's land. This is a very common site for cancers that are missed. And you must look at Peckless Major in, in a classical MLO. And as you do that, you can, you can see that the Peckless Major is clearly visible. The breast parenchyma is here. And then you have this space, which is where you look for any lumps or any disease, which is not there. You can see that. That is the area, right? This area. This is an important area. This, is, this area falls into the milk line of the bar or the milk line or no man's land. The bar is the name of a very famous radiologist, breast radiologist, who actually conducts these classes and he's, he's got many um, uh, courses that run. Now looking at it, you can see that there is a retraction of nipple here, which is visible. The architecture is distorted. That's one thing. And then you have this lesion, which a lot of you have described. It's a, there is, there are microcalcification, architecture is distorted, and there is a speculated lesion, which goes in favor of it being malignancy. And uh, this would qualify as Birard 5 easily. And therefore, you would, when you talk about mammography also, you would insist therefore on bilateral and the two views, as I said, craniocaudal and medial lateral oblique. And you should look for it carefully. If you are lucky, you are able to see the lymph nodes also here. In this case, there are no lymph nodes. Clinically, also, there are no nodes. And therefore, it is a N0 disease. But there is 
a lump and there is a mammographic feature of it being a significant one. So, you should look at it as suspicious. Now, well, there are limitations in our description of, we have discussed breast cases so many times in the past, but there are limitations in showing it all the sites. We could have done better, but we'll try and let the whole thing be explained to you differently. This is the lump and uh, we normally use the vernier caliper to measure it and that is necessary because this is 4 into 3 centimeters lump as per the measurement using vernier caliper. That is 4 into 3 centimeters using a caliper. Don't measure with your fingers. So we are down to triple assessment where classically good history including family history including history of hormonal intake or any that is hormone replacement therapy etc and to know whether the patient is premenopausal or postmenopausal she is premenopausal and also to take a family history which I mentioned etc etc then examination and when you are describing it please do mention that I examined the patient after taking informed consent in a good daylight in three position sitting supine and reclining why sitting why supine and why reclining well sitting position is ideal to look for the levels of nipple irida complex breasts visible dilated veins mostly inspect inspection is better done in this position and any visible bulge dimpling or pude orange PDO or any satellite nodules they are better appreciated on inspection but naturally even in, in uh, when you inspect it in a sitting position the inframemory fold needs to be examined carefully because that is where you may not be able to reach especially in the large breasted women it can be a problem so inspection is better done in a sitting position and actually we prefer to examine axilla also in a sitting position most of us because it is easier you have an access to the entire axilla supine position is ideal for palpation because what happens is in a supine position the breast falls apart and when it falls away laterally so you can feel the lump against the chest wall so it's easier right against the chest wall it's easier to palpate so for palpation this becomes easier to do in a supine position then why have reclining the reclining has an advantage of both the sitting and supine position it's kind of this position so what it does is it kind it provides you uh, an advantage of the levels that you can see axilla you can see and you can feel for the inframemory fold so must examine the breast in all three positions some people also like to mention that I examined it by arms being raised up not hands arms up right then bending forward these are more of uh, tests to look for arm up is basically what will the arm up do it will put some traction on the ligaments of cupa which are attached to the pectoral fascia so when the arms go up they could they could be a if there is an infiltration into the ligaments of cupa that's the muscle that's the fascia and that's the breast now the ligaments of cupa are attached like this so if there is infiltration in the ligament of cupa it can cause a smooth depression which is called a dimple a dimple is a smooth depression and we call it dimpling now 
this is when the ligament of Cooper pulls it down. Now, if the ligament of Cooper is replaced by a crab, you can imagine there will be an erratic depression. So, that is how you differentiate it from, you know, other scenarios. It is not podiorange. Podiorange is caused by a totally different mechanism. So, dimpling is a smooth depression and this is called puckering. Puckering, pucker, you know, you it puckers kind of instead of one grip, there are multiple grips. See, if there is, uh, if there are multiple pulls under the skin and if the ligament of Cooper is, too many of them are involved, that will be irregular, erratic. So, dimpling is a much smoother the way of, I mean, the way it happens. Anyway, so we go to the other entity which is called Pode Orange. Instead of, I mean, it's a, it's a, it should be pronounced as it is, it's a French word, Pode Orange, so the orange peel appearance. And usually it is, this is the skin, the subdermal lymphatics, which if uh, blocked, by anything, they will produce edema of the skin here. So, skin would bulge except where there are hair follicles attachment. So, that will give the appearance of a orange peel. And the mechanism is very different from what we tend to imagine. Now, in a locally advanced disease, the axillary nodes are matted and they are large. So, the lymphatic drainage is blocked. There is stasis because this is where they are blocked. So there is a uh, backflow of lymph. Especially the sappy plexus, we know that. Oh, actually, remember subdermal lymphatics have a stasis which leads to edema and the skin bulges except where there are hair follicles so it's tethered here otherwise it's a irregular skin that's called podi orange so this will usually happen in a local it was a backflow rather than uh, most people tend to get confused on this. This is the, this is, these are the lymph nodes and they block the flow of lymph. So, there is backflow to the subdermal lymphatics which leads to a scenario there where there is the subdermal lymphatics get, uh, lymph flow is blocked so there is edema. So, this, this is what you will see in the examination. And as I mentioned, in the sitting position, it's also easier to look for the axillary lymph nodes. And you should, you should be able to do that by moving the arm in all directions. So, good history, clinical examination, followed by imaging. I'll take a separate lecture on triple assessment because I will confine ourselves to this case. But remember, in all women, there are more than 40 and some people say 35. I'm talking about diagnostic. Uh, imaging that is the imaging of choices mammography remember if there is uh, more parenchyma or the breast is dense it will look white and the lesion looks white also so it will not show as clearly therefore in denser and younger breasts mammography is not good because white against white, you would not be able to appreciate. But as there is more fat later on, there is a possibility that you would be able to appreciate it better. So, when, when, when the breasts are less dense, usually after 35 to 40 years, most people take 40 as a cutoff. A lot of people take 35 as a cutoff, so 
Mammography is the investigation of choice. It's a very sensitive investigation. Ultrasound is useful in denser breasts, right? But it has its limitations. The major one being it is operator dependent. Naturally, it's only as good as the person who's doing it. And the other thing is, it is, uh, um, I mean, uh, it is not possible to appreciate the complete uh, architecture of the breast, especially when it is, um, it is uh, suspicious or when, when you're looking for uh, aspects which like microcalcification, although it can be seen because DCIS is better appreciated with mammography because of microcalcification, but you can use ultrasound for the same purpose. Uh, but needs, as I mentioned, a very smart operator who should be able to make. That's that's the major. So if you're asked, the 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 role of ultrasound is in younger and denser breasts, but it is operator dependent. It is also uh, useful in finding out the underlying DCIS. But the investigation of choices, mammography, MRI is a problem solving tool. And it often becomes a problem causing tool because it is very sensitive. It lights up everything. So very sensitive. So it will pick up too many artifacts. And in fact, it is believed that MRI decreases the rates of breast conservation surgery but useful to rule out multicentricity. Now, multicentricity and multifocality is decided not based on the quadrant, which was the earlier concept. Multiple regions in one quadrant is multifocality. And multiple regions in all quadrants is more than one quadrant is multicentricity. Now, this is we now define with the distance. So, four. Four centimeters. Uh, and uh, in fact, easier to remember, four to five centimeters is. Multicentricity would be if they are beyond one quadrant, which now has been defined as with distance. Four centimeters. Beyond that, it is multicentric. Within four centimeters, they are all multifocal. And multicentricity is a contraindication to breast conservation. Important to know. But remember one thing that ultrasound is mandatory to stage axilla now. This is AJCC 8th edition. Clinically, if you find it is N0 axilla, which means there is no lymph node in the axilla. It has to be qualified by ultrasound to call it N0. So ultrasound is now, as I mentioned in other presentation, other scenarios, is considered the extension of clinical examination. So you should not stage a, a tumor or axilla without doing an ultrasound. So ultrasound is so important. Now that's about the workup. And the third part now is core needle biopsy, which is the gold standard. We don't do FNAC anymore, and there are hardly any indications for FNAC. Why not FNAC? Core biopsy versus FNAC is a commonly asked question. Remember, FNAC has false negatives because it is a cytology. It doesn't have tissue. So you can miss, and negative FNAC actually has a limited role. It's only the positive FNAC which is important. Then there is also a problem of false positives in FNAC. False negatives I mentioned, false positives in certain hyperactive or hyperplastic states, states in breast. It may show up the, you know, the, the atypical cells and you can get confused. Then this tells you about the tissue, the grade, biomarkers which are so important but i think the more important part is invasiveness 
Core needle biopsy can tell you whether it's an in situ tumor or invasive tumor, which FNAC will not be able to tell you. Now, why, is bi why are biomarkers important? Like in this case, you will find it relevant. We need to find out about the ER, PR, HER to new and KI67 proliferating index. Based on this now, <coughs> we have divided the breast cancers into luminal type A and B. And actually, it is, it is very, very essential to know before we proceed with treatment. Now, if you do corneal biopsy before imaging, what can go wrong? You can create art, artifacts, you know, you can have some blood clots inside and then on imaging it can give you a false picture. So it can distort your picture. Therefore, the order is the same. History, clinical examination followed by imaging, mammography which is preferably more than 40, less than 40 ultrasound or MRI. I often say ultrasound is a poor man's MRI and MRI is a rich man's ultrasound. The problem with MRI is the cost, but the advantages are Quite, quite. I mean, quite. Uh, there, there, there are very many factors that you would pick up, in, especially in a dense breast. And the problem in the dense breast with mammography is dense breast would be white, and the lesion would also be white, so you may not be able to pick up. So, is there no other way? No, we can do tomosynthesis. Tomosynthesis goes in various axes to get the same uh, image uh, from all all directions. So, chances of missing it are minimal. MRI is a problem solving tool and I often call it the problem causing tool because uh, it can pick up too many artifacts. It's, it's very sensitive but not very specific and it can be useful in picking up multicentricity which is defined as uh, multiple lesions in many quadrants, not in one quadrant which is now defined by the distance rather than the quadrants that again has changed in AJCCA tradition. Ultrasound is necessary for staging the axilla. That's about what you'll do in this case also. Once you've done it, then we'll proceed to management. Are these investigations enough? Whenever you're asked a question in the exam, investigations to confirm the diagnosis, to stage the disease and to treat the patient. To confirm the diagnosis, we will be doing triple assessment, which we have done. Now, to stage it, I've taught in the previous lectures T, N, and M. So, you have done for T, you've done for N. What about M? So, if you get the T and M stage finally, do we need a metastatic worker for this lesion? The answer is metastatic worker, which basically means one should be clear CT thorax and abdomen and pelvis, bone scan, and in some cases people do talk about PET scan, although there is only a 2B recommendation. Now, this is a metastatic workup. Metastatic workup is only done in locally advanced breast carcinoma, which is T4 with any N and M0, N2 with any T and M0, and uh, basically some people take T3, N1, M0 also, and uh, some people take T3, N0, M0 also. So these are the LABC stages. Now for LABC it may be required that you do a metastatic workup, all cases. Because LABC, which is locally advanced breast cancer, locally advanced breast cancer is potentially metastatic. That's why you need to do it. But in other cancers, that is early breast cancer, only symptomatic patients. Like if the patient has got bone pains, we do a bone scan. MRI brain if the patient is symptomatic for neurological symptoms. And a lot of people like to do a good LFT and look for alkaline phosphatase. The alkaline phosphatase, which is 
heat le boil based on that they take a decision so that's about the metastatic workup the treatment would depend upon the stage in this case there was no node and this is a t2n0 m0 disease because it's less than 5 centimeters so t2n0 m0 would still be an early breast cancer now this is bordering the locally advanced so we we need to know the core needle biopsy result and if it is triple negative which was the case here then invariably we put these patients on it is beneficial to put these patients on neurogen chemotherapy provided they want breast conservation surgery but there is no difference in outcome based on sequencing what does that mean you give neurogen chemotherapy followed it up with surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy or you do surgery neuro then adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy etc no difference in the outcome so what is the advantage of putting the patient neurogen chemotherapy number 1 it can down size and down stage the tumor so that you can do breast conservation surgery two it takes care of it provides an in vivo chemosensitivity test so you know the same regime can be used later on and thirdly it can actually take care of the micro metastases which are not visible but they can be taken care of now if this patient on counseling is willing to go for breast conservation surgery we need to do the counseling very effectively we'll discuss the management of breast cancer in detail in some talk but counseling is mandatory if she wants a breast conservation surgery and this being triple negative breast cancer even even otherwise it is felt since triple negative breast cancer responds very well to chemotherapy a lot of people would like to put them on texin based chemotherapy in order to get what is called a pathological complete response that is the complete disappearance of tumor pathologically also clinical complete response is when it clinically disappears therefore when in the initial phase when you are trying to uh, prepare for neurogen chemotherapy if we are giving and you put a clip in the core of the tumor that is if the patient is then put on chemotherapy and the tumor disappears we will know where the tumor was and then we can remove the clip along with the margin well so the options are many we can do upfront surgery which is modified radical mastectomy or we can put the patient on neurogen chemotherapy taxane based and then all the cycles which are 4 to 6 and then operate in this case we'll put a clip and assess response using a criteria which is called racist criteria which stands for response evaluation criteria in solid tumors where you look for the shrinkage of the tumor with the cycles and if there's no response we take up the patient for surgery and the <coughs> third option is i mean the third option is you give three cycles of new adjuvant chemotherapy and then have a sandwich for surgery and then give adjuvant chemotherapy but if you are planning breast conservation surgery new adjuvant chemotherapy may actually help otherwise one can simply plan the modified radical mastectomy that is adequate surgery with a clear margin and modified radical mastectomy means removal of breast plus skin ellipse including tumor and lump with 2 cm margin plus axillary tail of spans plus pectoralis fascia plus level 1 to level 3 nodes 
which are decided divided by pec minor level 2 is behind pec minor level 1 lateral to it level 3 medial to it I'll preserving preserving peculus major muscle with nerve supply which is medial and lateral pectoral nerve medial is lateral lateral is medial you can watch my videos on this plus nerve to serratus anterior and nerve to latissimus dorsi preserve all this and remove the rest and certainly of course axillary vein which naturally needs to be preserved if you are planning breast conservation surgery i'll go to the picture only to explain this we can do many procedures if it shrinks and it becomes amenable to the round block mastopexy we can do it what can we do we can have a round block mastopexy which can take care of it or we can do this is it is possible to do many procedures including the bat wing there's so many options these videos you can watch so if you are planning breast conservation surgery we need to counsel well it need it if you give neurogen chemotherapy it will shrink further and you can have a good outcome and then we will have a separate incision for the axilla that's how you can manage it most of them would require adjuvant chemotherapy and that would depend on our uh, histopathology report after modified radical mastectomy and breast conservation surgery and adjuvant radiation is given to most of these patients all patients for that that are subjected to breast conservation surgery uh, would require radiation so the one very important contraindication to breast conservation surgery is rt is not available or patient is unfit for rt there could be cardiac problems or collagen diseases etc patient is not willing to come for follow up because it will require regular follow up to come uh, and cosmetically you are not going to get a good result so combination of various things and of course pregnancy pregnancy is an absolute contraindication to breast conservation surgery because radiation can be a problem although it can be possible in third trimester pregnancy if you are operating then patient delivers and radiation can be given chemotherapy is also a problem because that is that can cause damage to the, the to the fetus so these are the various options and that's how you can discuss this case i hope you find it useful there's plenty to discuss in terms of triple assessment which i'll take separately i'll also take a lecture on breast conservation surgery when to do what to do but this was pertaining to this case only as to how do we approach metastatic workup is mandatory in all labc which again i'll take separately there's a talk on labc separately but in early breast cancer if patient is symptomatic we do a metastatic workup the NCCN guidelines are that you do the CT thorax, abdomen, pelvis plus bone scan and PET scan in some select cases. You have a PET racist criteria also. That's where it's useful. If you put the patient on neurogen chemotherapy, you can assess the response using PET scan as well as racist criteria. Racist criteria have already defined re response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. Where more than 75% responses taken as responder 50 percent and above our responders if the tumor totally disappears clinically and radiologically we call it clinical complete response if after surgery we send it to his pathologist and he finds or she finds nothing there then we call it pathological complete response putting the patient on your urgent chemotherapy especially in triple negative breast cancer has been found to be able to let us get some pathological complete response pcr rates which is a predictor of good outcome and a good group of tumors amongst the triple negatives that's about the management most of them would be subjected to surgery and uh, surgery would vary from breast conservation to modified radical mastectomy. Breast conservation is possible and feasible at any stage. The outcome is just the same. But patient has to be willing to come for radiation. The radiation has to be available. Patient should know that follow-up is mandatory. And uh, in general, depending upon this being triple negative, we would not be putting the patient on, new, uh, on hormone therapy in any case. The patient is going to respond to 
this patient had was triple negative and uh, CHI-67 index was also more than 40 percent. So it was a very aggressive triple negative tumor. So likely to respond very well to chemotherapy because chemotherapy acts on rapidly multiplying cells. So tri triple negative or ERPR negative tumors respond better. And uh, as opposed to the ERPR positive tumors. So that's what should be the take home in this case. Thank you very much.